When it comes to practicing, then you often have a very clear idea about scales and exercises, which you can easily turn into a practice routine or a schedule. Habits like that help you measure your progress and make things efficient. When it comes to actually getting better at soloing, that's often a lot less clear, and you actually have to watch out that you're not just noodling the same stuff without getting anywhere. In this video, I'm going to show you how I think when I'm playing and make your solos more melodic, because just focusing on playing better licks isn't really enough. My choice of song comes from a gig I played a few weeks ago with a band that was mostly people I hadn't met before, and during the gig, the saxophone player called a song that I didn't know. When you get asked to play a song that you don't know on a gig, that can be really difficult depending on the band and the situation. Sometimes people don't understand or even accept that you may or may not know a certain song. But while I'm building up to a lot of drama, then that was actually not the case here. It was a very relaxed gig and we were just calling standards to play. We ended up playing the song, which is pretty easy to learn on the spot. And while I never played it, I think it is a fairly common jazz standard. The only hurdle is that it's mostly played quite fast. The song that I'm talking about is the standard I Want to Be Happy, which I think is mostly famous from the Stan Getz Oscar Peterson version, but there's also a Sonny Rollins version that I'd already heard before. Because the song is so simple, then the saxophone player actually just explained the harmony so that I didn't have to read it off iReel. Okay, so it's tonic diminished to two, two five, two five, turn around. And the bridge is two five to four, Back to dominant, and then a 3625, where it's the dominant on the 6 and the 505. Five. I think the real important thing is here that you find a way to practice soloing that isn't random, that you have a goal and something to work on. This is mostly about being more melodic, but that's of course also a subjective term. I find that good jazz lines are melodic, but I also know that a lot of people think that jazz lines are all just abstract theory constructions. Let me know if it's something else, if you think that there's a definition of what melodic is. Here's first a simple solo, just me playing through the progression, trying to connect the harmony and sort of get the sound of the chords across, stumbling here and there. And for the rest, let's just check out what's happening. <laughs> just keeping it simple, staying in that one position, and also really just using the arpeggio, so. All just F major seven arpeggio. And then of course, when you move from F major seven to F sharp diminished, then two notes change. The F becomes an F sharp, and the E becomes an E flat. And those are the two notes that I'm playing on the F sharp diminished, so. Trying to connect the chords. And then that's really what's happening for the rest as well. The one th note that changes going from G minor to C7 is of course the F going to E, so that's the note that I put on the one of the C7 bar. I kind of do the same thing just using another arpeggio on the next set, so the arpeggio from the third, the B flat major 7 arpeggio, and then of course you have the turnaround. So here on the D7, here I'm using uh, the E flat as a target note. So. And then just a really simple melody, sort of an echo moving through that 2-5 at the end. Let's go on to the next part where things kind of start to stumble a little bit. The first phrase is again just sort of taking the upper structure of the F major 7 and then using the E flat, similar to uh, what I did in the turnaround, to really get the F sharp diminished out there. But then here, you can kind of hear that I'm, I don't know if you can hear it, but at least for me, I can really hear that I'm just sort of hesitating a bit because I'm not so used to the progression. This next phrase is sort of a little bit of a emergency uh, exit. That's not really what I hope to play, I think. And then from here, it goes into more of like a bob line, so. That's sort of just back on track and that keeps on going. I think the only other thing that's worth mentioning for this is maybe because I've been listening to that first Jim Hall trio album, uh, there's like a lot of rhythmical phrases and especially on the tonic chord here, uh, when I come out on. 
sort of just really simple, more rhythmical phrases. I think a lot of this, and you'll see that also, is about balance, about finding different ways of playing melodies and different ways of coming up with stuff that you can play and working on that and getting that into your playing. The bridge, which is also kind of common for a bridge, I think, is moving another place so we're not just cycling around uh, the tonic like we are in the A parts. Something else needs to happen and also sort of the, the mood of the solo has to change a little bit and it also does. So with this, I'm actually sort of really setting up the contrast in the last phrase of the second A. We have the... Which is more like a swing phrase, it's definitely not a bebop phrase. And then once we get to the bridge and things start moving away from just cycling around in F major and going to B flat, then it is also just makes a lot more sense to sort of change gears and play more of a bebop line, which is also what I'm doing using triplets and uh, arpeggios, and it's just a lot busier than it was in the A part. But what is also different here is that I start using longer notes and I'm playing a higher register. So I'm out of this area a little bit, just a little bit up to get some higher notes that I can sustain. And then I'm sort of leaning a lot more on that instead of having only short notes and playing more rhythmically. Again, also just to get a different feel in the bridge compared to the A parts. And then finally we get the last A. With this, you can hear there's maybe a bit more blues. I guess that's still coming out of that uh, Jim Hall uh, album that I've been listening to. At least I think that's the, the vibe that I'm hearing in it. I'm staying in the high register. Now, instead of using like an F major seven as the main arpeggio for the first chord, I'm using an uh, F major six. Or at least you can choose to hear it like that. You can also hear it as if I'm using F major pentatonic. But what I'm using here is that you can use that as sort of a way to get to the F sharp diminished. Because then I can repeat that. But then instead of playing the D, then the, the six that I had for before, I'm playing the E flat, which is giving me the, the sound of that diminished chord. And then the phrases on the two fives, kind of using sort of the fact that they're variations of each other. So you first get a statement and then I'm varying that. Something that I'll return to in the second solo, because I think that's a very important thing to actually work on in your solos. The next solo is going to go a, a lot further in terms of developing the melodies, because I think the important thing here is that the solo becomes stronger uh, in terms of melody, that the ideas connect and that you're not just playing something on this chord and then something on the next chord and then something on the third chord, because that's not a solo, that's just a bunch of licks next to each other and that's not how music works. So let's go to the second solo. So here there's really a lot of difference from the first solo because it's sort of one melodic idea that's then really going through the, the first A part until the turnaround. And it starts with a really simple idea. It's a very visual, and you can, as you can tell, I'm also moving uh, through the different positions, which I'm kind of used to. I'll return to that in a bit. So the first main motif that I'm starting with is really just... Now, if you're working on moving motifs through a song, then it is usually a lot easier if you're playing melodies that are simple to move around. So you don't have to think about moving like a eight or 10 note melody through some changes because that's just a lot of calculating kind of. Mostly you're gonna be doing stuff with a few notes, especially if you're working on it, if you're not used to it. So in that way, this is a really good example of it. Again, also really like a Jim Hall thing today. Moving two notes in that to get to the next chord which is really just moving the two low notes, the G and the E, down to F sharp and E flat to keep that melody going. And that then becomes the first motif, so... Also really spelling out the changes, really just connecting with the changes. Then the next part is using, so if you look at this shape, then, and that's really something that's incredibly practical when you're working with motivic development on the guitar, you can use sort of visual shapes to to sort of get an idea about going from one place to the next. And that is kind of what I'm doing here. So on the G minor seven that follows, that's still sort of tied into that same kind of shape. You see uh, Wes do this all the time as well. And then of course I'm making a, a variation on that. So I'm ending in a different way. So I think that's another thing that's also super important when it comes to motivic development. Of course, it's a good exercise to practice taking a motif and then just moving that 
through the changes. But if you don't develop the motif, then it's going to get really robotic and predictable and boring. And that's not what you're looking for at all. You want to try some stuff here. Here, I'm actually changing like the first time. That's the, that's the rhythm. And the second time, it's a completely different rhythm. I'm not repeating the note, but the motif is still there somehow. I think that's also as important that you try to do that, change the rhythm, change how you end it. I'm actually doing both in this case. And then I move further down. And now you can also really tell that I'm kind of still using the same melodic structure, but by now the visual pattern is maybe there, but uh, like it's not that you can take the first pattern and then go like, oh, I'm going to voice lead this, this three times. And then I'm going to end up with, uh, with what I have in the second time that the G minor 7, C7 uh, appears. So it's um, with a fancy word would be like an artistic representation of that first melody. The rhythm is closer to the second time I played it. So it's also gradually evolving. And then here, as you can tell, like I'm moving around on the neck a lot more. Even within the phrase here, I'm starting to slide around, add some trills. So the lines are getting a little bit more complicated in, in that respect. And then in the turnaround, it goes into what would really be a bebop line. So, or maybe even something that's later, maybe it's even a little bit more abstract than just a straight ahead bebop line uh, with all the... I don't know, uh, you could find that in a, bo in a bop line as well, I guess. A lot of this is really about balance, that you're using different ways that you can play. So sometimes you can play blues phrases. I had that already in the first solo. Uh, sometimes you want to play bebop lines. Sometimes it's more like swing and rhythm that you focus on. Sometimes they're only short notes. Sometimes they're long notes. And all these different things are what you're working with to make your solo more interesting. Because it can't be the same all the time, because then it's going to get boring. So you need to listen to what am I doing all the time and then try to change that other different things that I can work on using and then focus on using those. So when it comes to work on motivic development, then I would say this is really about listening to yourself. You know, that's the first place where if you want to learn how to play what you hear, you need to listen to what you just played and then see if you can imagine what should come next. And when you're doing this, I mean, you, I'm not thinking about what notes I'm playing. I'm not going to play like uh, and then think oh, now I want to hear uh, F sharp diminished or A flat minor pentatonic or something like that. That doesn't really make any sense. I'm not thinking about notes. I'm really trying to think about what should it sound like and I'm going to try to play that. And that's of course a little bit difficult to get used to because it's it's not all the things that you're practicing, but that is really what you want to be working on. And it really pays off to just take like the first few bars and then a simple motif. And then you can hear that I'm also really changing it. So first the, the... Then I start changing around the way that I'm ending the phrases, changing the order of the notes to develop the motif. I think those kind of exercises are really useful, that you play a phrase and then try to listen for what you want to hear next. Here there's a lot of contrast with what we came out of with the turnaround where it was really sort of very arpeggio based, not really that melodic. I'm really still starting with like just an F major triad. You want to really change up what you're doing that you don't want to stick to a motif too long. It's important to also just create some conclusions and try something else, go into other things. There's going to be some call and response also. If you consider this a call then that kind of becomes a response to that. And then it's just continuing with sort of a very basic, simple uh, bebop line. The next thing that's sort of maybe interesting to point out is that I'm kind of doing the same thing that I was doing in the first solo, because I'm coming up with a really sort of simple But now I'm continuing that phrase and letting that sort of transition into the bridge, but it's still like a very, very basic F phrase, not really a bebop line, it's, it's more like a, a riff or a swing thing. Okay, so here in the bridge, there's a lot more happening again. 
uh, I'm still going into the bebop mode because the, ch the chords are changing, we're going somewhere else, then just playing some bebop lines is, is sort of the thing to do. And actually, like having a more active bridge is not really that far-fetched if you listen to a song like uh, like the melody of Satin Doll, where it's like... Right, so it's very, very sort of simple and not moving around. And then once you get to the bridge, which is kind of similar to this one actually, then there's more happening. It's still moving back and forth, but the interval or the range gets lar larger and there are just more notes. That's also a little bit the, the effect of what's happening here. Of course, I'm playing a lot more notes than, <laughs> than Sad and Doll, but still. And then there's also this really nice uh, pedal point idea on the B5 meter 7 that I just want to highlight. When it comes to the bebop lines here, I'm not really working with the motivic development because I already used that a lot. So now it's nice to have the contrast of just having some busy moving lines with some color and some energy. But in the second line of the bridge, I'm using this, which of course is developing a motif. It's very simple, right? And then we get this trill. So it's a little bit as if I sort of felt like now in the second solo, I was allowed to use trills more. Uh, which is something that I'm kind of focusing on using a bit more. Maybe that also has something to do with it. And then we get the echo of that one. I don't know, that's kind of how I hear it. And that's the association that I have with it listening back, not what I was thinking about when I was playing it. Let's check out the last day where, again, I sort of get into trouble a little bit with what I want to play in terms of the melodies that I want to use. getting into trouble it's actually not that clear when I'm listening to it now but what's happening is that I'm ending low so it's ending like here on the bridge and then I'm going back up kind of using the same thing with like an F6 going to the F sharp diminished and using using that or, or F major pentatonic and then here adding the E flat because then it sounds like a blues phrase and it's also spelling out the changes it's like two birds with one stone so that, that's really the effect of this, of having that E-flat in there. Sometimes you have a melodic idea and you're like listening for, okay, what has to happen now? And here I can just hear like, oh, that, that didn't go the way that I wanted to. It kind of has the same kind of vibe and the same kind of rhythm also. And it's giving me the flat nine on the C7 as well. So I don't know why I think there's something wrong with it, but uh, because the motif itself is actually really nice, but it sort of didn't come out the way that I wanted to. And then it just sort of goes into a bebop line and there's nothing too spectacular about that. And then ending really just in some, some major blues. Now another thing that I think is super useful when it comes to improving your soloing is actually to have, as you can tell, I have a really strong overview of the chord progression. And there are a few different ways that you can approach this. And I have one video that I think you want to check out because there I cover my way of looking at it, but also how Pat Martino and Barry Harris look at chord progressions and make them simpler and make them easier to solo over. That's this video.